statement just made. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Jamaica to introduce an address by the head of government. President, Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, it is my distinct honour to introduce the Prime Minister of Jamaica, the Most Honourable Andrew Holness, who will deliver a pre-recorded statement at the general debate of the 75th session of the UN General Assembly. Your Excellency, Mr. Volkan Buskir, I extend the congratulations on your election to the presidency of this 75th session of the General Assembly. I also commend your predecessor, His Excellency, Mr. Tijani Mohamed Bande, for maintaining the focus on social justice and climate action as critical elements of the decade of recovery. Your Excellency, during your term of office, you can be confident of Jamaica's continued commitment to the global recovery effort through a multilateral approach to finding viable solutions to the pandemic. Mr. President, Jamaica welcomes the significance and timeliness of this special theme to commemorate the 75th UN General Assembly. Indeed, the future to which we aspire is contingent on an effective and renewed multilateral system in which the United Nations must play a pivotal role. Prior to the advent of the pandemic, Jamaica had been recording significant progress in our pursuit of economic independence through macroeconomic stability, reduction in our high levels of public debt, poverty alleviation, human capital formation, and increased employment opportunities while protecting the vulnerable in our society. This placed us in a position to implement an initial social and economic stimulus program, in addition to our early response to control the spread of the coronavirus and to treat those infected. However, our economy now faces the triple challenges of reduced revenues, increased health and social expenditures, and an ongoing climate crisis, which threatens to undo years of hard-won development gains. Mr. President, the pandemic has highlighted pre-existing vulnerabilities and multiple structural weaknesses within our economies, large and small, rich and poor, and clearly demonstrated the systemic nature of risk worldwide. The great difference lies, however, in our respective abilities to mitigate the development reversals arising from the multifaceted impact of the pandemic and to recover stronger. Developing countries must therefore devise strategies to respond effectively. We must rebalance our economies and rethink the nature of global cooperation so that we not only recover stronger, but position ourselves to become more resilient to future systemic shocks. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the interconnectedness and interdependence of our world. It has underscored the need for strengthened and renewed multilateralism. As we strive to respond and recover stronger, we must reimagine the way nations cooperate. Persistent global problems require consistent cooperation to achieve strategic global solutions. Small Caribbean states, which are designated as middle-income countries, but whose small economies are largely dependent on one or just a few industries, are most deeply affected by this crisis. They urgently need increased access to concessional and non-concessional financing given their limited fiscal space, reduced availability of public resources for investment, and the struggle to attract private investment. We see access to international development finance and the establishment of special funds to complement our response as an imperative, and we endorse the Secretary General's call for solidarity. I therefore convey Jamaica's sincere appreciation to the United Nations for establishing its COVID-19 Response and Recovery Fund and encourage donor countries to contribute. This fund represents an excellent example of the effectiveness of multilateralism at work. Its inclusion of vulnerable middle-income countries recognizes the reality that if one member of the global community fails, the potential exists for all others to be impacted. The entire international community will therefore reap benefits from the support provided. An area which requires particular support from such a fund or similar cooperation mechanism is the digital divide. The pandemic has forced schools and workplaces to close, 
and people to practice social distancing. The internet has become our public square to meet and access critical information. However, approximately half of the world's population is still not connected to the internet with schools and work and healthcare and commerce and religious worship going online, persons without access to a reliable internet connection may be marginalized and disconnected entirely from the world. Now, more than ever, it is imperative that the digital divide not only be closed, but that countries are enabled to provide universal access to connectivity, as well as the tools to allow their societies and economies to capture the power of digital technologies. Universal, secure, and affordable connectivity is essential for greater participation in the global digital economy and for the attainment of inclusive, sustainable development. The pandemic has greatly accelerated the adoption of digital technologies and has provided developing countries in particular with an opportunity to leapfrog to a more digital economy. We call on the global community to respond with increased bilateral and multilateral cooperation in this area, which promises exponential increase in human capacity and economic dividends. We are heartened by the understanding, cohesion, and clarity for action displayed by the G20 digital economy ministers in their July declaration, the UNSG's high-level panel on digital cooperation, and last month's report on the task force on digital financing of the SDGs. All hands and ideas must be on deck for our national and collective digital resilience. Mr. President, myself as co-convener of the high-level event on financing for development in the era of COVID-19 and beyond, along with Secretary General Guterres and Prime Minister Trudeau, remain committed to facilitate the process of developing concrete and global solutions and actions to enable countries to respond and recover better from what the Secretary General refers to as the world's first development emergency. On September 29th, when we convene the second high-level event, leaders will have an opportunity to highlight the collective measures they deem most effective for resolving the crisis and to put forward recommendations for United Nations support. We look forward to hearing the actions proposed, including those related to closing the digital divide with a view to enabling robust and resilient recovery. Mr. President, we note with grave concern UN reports that women and girls continue to face discrimination globally and that there are persistent gaps in their participation in economic activity, decision-making, and political leadership. We are seeing that the pandemic has deepened socioeconomic inequalities and disproportionately impacted women and girls, leading to increased exposure to domestic violence and loss of livelihood. We are taking measures to ensure that our national recovery efforts include a gender perspective and harness the full potential of all members of our society as leaders, innovators, and agents of economic, social, and environmental change. We are committed to furthering our engagement with the UN and our international partners to implement the Spotlight Initiative and to increase our advocacy through mechanisms such as the Group of Friends on Women, Women's Economic Empowerment, Gender Parity, and Women Peace and Security. Mr. President, there is no doubt that the COVID-19 pandemic has propelled the United Nations to a critical crossroads. It has exposed and exacerbated the gross inequalities that still exist. It has further reinforced the need for the international community to scale up cooperation to respond to the growing and deepening health crisis. The rapid spread of the novel coronavirus is exerting immense pressure on healthcare systems globally, many of which are already under stress. It has compounded existing disparities in health and increased the risk for the vulnerable, particularly the elderly and persons requiring medical care for non-communicable diseases. Given our limited fiscal space, we have adopted a whole of government approach to the pandemic while mobilizing the support of all our citizens. The pandemic has brought to the fore the importance of investing in non-communicable diseases prevention and care. Bridging the investment gap for prevention and treatment of NCDs must therefore be an essential pillar 
for our response to the pandemic and health security. We thank our bilateral and international partners, including PAHO and WHO, for their invaluable support and advice in our efforts to address this health crisis and its socioeconomic impact. As the international community works in earnest to develop a COVID-19 vaccine, Jamaica welcomes efforts aimed at accelerating the equitable access to the vaccine, diagnostics, and therapeutics. We believe that the ambition to expedite development of these tools must be matched with a determination to ensure that they are safe, effective, and accessible to all. Mr. President, in keeping with our commitment to the full realization of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, Jamaica is deeply invested in finding solutions at the national, regional, and multilateral levels to respond effectively and decisively to this pandemic. The immense challenges demand that as a global community, we combine our efforts in a sustained and coordinated manner to identify opportunities for effective remedial action. As we seek to create the future we want, we must summon our energies, talent, and resources to combat this global crisis with fortitude. We must, Mr. President, act collectively, decisively, and immediately. Our decisions now will determine the kind of future we create. Let's together do the right thing. I thank you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister, Minister of Defence, Economic Growth and Job Creation of Jamaica for the address just made. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Samoa to introduce an address by the head